So welcome. This is a talk on geocaching. This is a talk. Can you hear me in the back okay? Yeah, okay. So how many people here have ever gone out to find a geocache? Keep your hands up. How many people here have found more than five geocaches? All right. If you haven't, have, uh, more than 25 geocaches. More than 50. More than 100. 500. Okay. All right. Uh, well, okay. So, of uh, I found over 2,000. So I was going to wonder if there was anyone like 60,000 because some of the people just tens of thousands. So, um, and uh, so in this talk, we're going to go over what geocaching is, how it started. This is a slide from a few years ago. This was released by geocaching.com that kind of shows how geocaching spread over the world. You can see it's mostly in areas of the world with leisure time, leisure income, uh, high-tech populace, um, and where tourists of those countries go as well. Uh, so it, it's not popular everywhere, but pretty much anywhere you go, you can probably find a geocache within uh, a day or two, except for maybe like up in those Siberia areas there. Um, okay, so let me close this. Close that. Sorry. I'm trying to do this without a mouse. I see all my secrets. Okay, so my name is Ilanka Dunin. I've been speaking on a lot of different things here at DragonCon. This is one of my favorite hobbies, is geocaching. And I like it, um, it's a high-tech scavenger hunt. Uh, and um, I like it because it, it gets me out away from my computer, gets me outside, uh, gets me looking for things, but it still has that geeky kind of treasure hunt uh, feel to it. So geocaches are generally things. They, that Tupperware box is a very typical, what's called a traditional geocache. And uh, they can be as small as, as the bottom. At the bottom left there, those two little black bean looking things are about the size of the, the end of your little finger. And they're tiny little magnetics. They're called nano caches. And they're usually magnetic and they're stuck to something. And inside is a tiny little strip of paper where people will sign their initials and the date. And then they put it back. And then other people go along and try and find it. Um, there's currently, as I checked this year, there's over 3 million geocaches hidden around the world in over 190 countries. Uh, and there's over 8 million geocachers around the world. Any of you that found a bunch of geocaches, feel free to jump on in and, and share your own experiences because it's very much a, a geocaching community. Uh, anyone can place a cache, it's free. Anyone can find a cache, it's free. There are what's called premium geocache. You can be a premium member, it costs like $30 a year. Uh, and the geocaches will have the logbook, they'll have sometimes little toys in them for the kids. The rule is you can take something as long as you leave something of equal or greater value. So there's many different ways that you can find geocaches and there's not just geocaches. There are these things called letterboxes. Anybody letterboxers here in the room? Letterboxing predated geocaching by about 100 years. They wouldn't put uh, coordinates. They'd say things like um, follow the, the path to the tree of three sisters and then listen for this, the, uh, the bell, which might mean go down to the path to find a tree with three trunks and then follow a train track. And, and so they'd give clues and things. But these days they can give you the, the latitude and longitude. So this, um, I got this. This is right near here. This is uh, downtown Atlanta. You can see the highways there. The different colors of caches. Each, this is deep, these are different types. I'll go over them in a minute. The ones with little smiley faces, the little yellow ones there, are ones that I have found, that I've found and that I have logged and to say that I have found it. So we're going to pick one here. So again, this is right near the hotels. And there's one, there's a little tiny triangular plaza. And there's a geocache there. Each cache has a name. In this case, the cache is arms wide open. So some of the locals may already be getting an idea of where this one is. You'll see that it has some stars there. Uh, the difficulty can be from one to five. In this case, it's a three and a half up to a one and a half. This cache, there's a date there. Um, 
let's see. So the date says it was placed September 1st, 2009. So uh, what, uh, nine years ago, uh, probably around Dragon Con. <laughs> it was September 1st. Um, and favorite points. It's got 56 favorite points, which is sort of like a like. Um, only people who are premium members can do a like, and you can do one like for every 10 caches that you found. So it, it's, a, it's a limited resource, uh, depending on how much you're, you're caching out there. So if you click on it, you will get a cache page. So again, up here we have the title, arms wide open, three and a half, one and a half, 56 favorite points. So an experienced cashier will kind of be able to read these. There's also attributes, and this will vary. So I, I might be able to read these saying, okay, it's dogs allowed, kids allowed, it's open 24 seven, findable during winter, someone in a wheelchair could find it. Um, there's buses, uh, you can ride a bike here, a motorbike. Stealth required, meaning don't let non-cachers see you grab it. Um, geocaching, geocaching started to become popular about the time that the Harry Potter movies became popular, the books. And so there's this thing of don't let the muggles see you, don't let the muggles find you. Um, and if a cache disappears, as caches sometimes will, they might say it's been muggled. And so this, uh, that little uh, uh, spy thing here says use stealth. Uh, if you have a stroller, that's there. The P in the the P in the cache means it's park and grab, meaning it's not going to take long to find. You can park, run out, grab it. Some caches, not so much. You're going to have to uh, park at a trailhead. These are the kinds that he goes for. You park at a trailhead and then hike, what, five miles up a mountain? Right, so definitely not a park and grab. So this is the actual uh, statue that's there, arms wide open. And um, has anybody found this cache? that's here in the room? Okay, so don't say anything. Those of you that uh, are cashers and you're looking at this, what might you think, knowing that it's a traditional cash? Any suggestions? In his pocket, that, that's an idea, yeah, yeah. It, it could be a t container or it could be tiny, it could be the size of your little finger, it could be a tiny little envelope. There could be a magnet here. Good. That's a possibility. Micromagnetic somewhere hidden on the statue. Good. Any other thoughts? Sorry? If, if uh, I, I'll give you a hint, which is that if you knew exactly where to look, you could probably see the cache in this picture. It could be hanging from a tree in the background. Very good. Could be one of his buttons. Could be one of his buttons. Good. So I'll, now this cache has been there for nine years. Over a thousand people have found it so far. So other things to keep in mind are you have to be aware of street cleaners. You have to be aware of snow. You have to be aware of you know people coming through and you know kids climbing all over a statue. So it has to be someplace that's secure but findable. I, I can't hear. A lapel pin. If it were behind a lapel, something that was protected, otherwise like if a hard rain comes down, it might wash it away. There is a lamp post in the background. Often lamp posts, if you go into Walmart parking lots, they'll have the post and they have that square housing. Generally those housings are not screwed down. So you can just grab it and lift straight up and then underneath is like a perfect place for caches. It's so perfect that it gets boring finding them. So they're called LPCs, lamp post caches. Uh, another common hide is with the magnetic hide key. Someone will go to a guardrail by the side of a road and they'll put the hide a key there and it's cool the first two or three times you find it and then it just gets really boring. Uh, so those are called GRC, guardrail caches. All right. So each cache has a hint. In this case, the hint might be put your left foot in. Any thoughts on where you might look? Hmm? In his pants, okay. All right, okay. So now the cache is actually there. In the arch of the shoe, there's a tiny little gap. And in there, somebody put a tiny little envelope with a tiny little log. 
So after here, if you have the energy, you can go out there. Again, try not to be super obvious about it, but if you reach in and you grab it, you can unfold it and then put your, put your name, put the, uh, the date. It doesn't have to be real, your real name. You can put your real name, you can put Snoopy, Mickey Mouse, as long as when you log it to the website, you can say signed as. So this is your verification that you found that particular geocache. All right. So again, looking at these different caches here, we have green, we have orange, we have blue, and these are the main cache types. So a green is what's called a traditional cache. So it's something that has a logbook that you're going to sign. It could be a teeny tiny logbook. A letterbox hybrid is an homage to what came before geocaching when it was just letterboxes with, with clues and hints. A puzzle cache is one where you have to solve a puzzle to get the coordinates to find the cache. Earth cache is where you don't sign something, but you, this is great for scouts. You have to go and make some sort of geological observation, like if there's a, a uh, uh, say a stream, a natural stream, and you have to like feel the water and guess what's the temperature of the water or how many gallons per minute is it flowing. Uh, Multicache, top right, the yellow one, you have to find one spot, find one geocache, and it gives you coordinates to the next one where you actually sign the final log. Event cache, like my t-shirt, Geo Woodstock, is where cachers get together. And these might be getting together for coffee at a Panera, or it might be 10,000 people getting together at a, at a major campground like this one was in, in Ohio a couple months ago. Cash in, trash out, or CETO is where cashers will get together to clean up trash in a park because nobody can find trash like a geocacher. We're going through everything. We find every bit, every bit of piece of paper. So when we go in with a trash bag and we take out the trash and the park owners love us and, and it's just great for the community. And then where go is kind of a combination between a video game and a geocache. It's something that you get on your phone and it's, it gets into alternate reality. So I created a where go in St. Louis where it would take you, your phone would take you to a certain set of coordinates and then uh, it'll pop up on your screen. You may think that you're in the parking lot of the Red Roof Inn, but in actuality, you are in an alternative reality future where the zombies have taken over. And this is the hospital that was the location of patient zero. So now you need to find the doctor to create the serum to end the zombie plague. She was last seen three miles southeast and so you go and you, you get and you go three miles southeast and along the way your phone will go and it'll pop up you are being attacked by a zombie fight run you know <laughs> and so you choose which of the two you want to do and over the course of an afternoon it'll kind of take you around a, uh, a particular neighborhood and then you find the doctor and you win and the world is saved and then you go on to your next cache somewhere goes are like that some are more tourist things it really depends now, so that one through five and one through five, each geocache can be one through five terrain, one through five difficulty. So a level one terrain literally means wheelchair accessible. Someone in a wheelchair could go up and could find that, that particular geocache. Two might be stroller, uh, a determined stroller mom could get to that cache. Three, you're gonna need some hiking. You're gonna maybe use your hands to go up some rocks. Four, you really need to be prepared. Or it might be a case that you're off trail. There's gonna be thorns, there's gonna be snakes. You need to be prepared. Five, terrain five, you need special equipment. You're gonna be scuba diving or you're gonna be rappelling down a mountain face. Or um, there's a geocache that's on the International Space Station. So that's terrain five. You need a rocket around you <laughs> in order to get to that particular geocache. So um, anyone that wants to talk about these high-level terrains, feel free to, to speak to him. He's how many, how many terrain four and above have you found? Like over 100. And, and you've needed like rope, or what's the most elaborate equipment you needed to have? Uh, most of the time, you can just hike to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. Speak oh, into the box. Oh, OK. Uh, most of the time you can just hike to where I've gone to the very difficult ones. Occasionally I have used a rope. Uh, some of them have involved going in caves or yeah. uh, being so you in need flashlights and, and some of them are like hidden under water. But I haven't had to scuba dive yet. There are some that do require scuba yep. diving, but yeah. uh, some you just need a boat to get to. Yeah. Um, uh, more it's the kind of puzzling ones that are interesting yeah. where you have to figure out how they hit it and how to get to it. Yeah. 
So then that gets into the difficulty of finding it. Is it in plain sight? Is it something that an experienced cashier would have to really kind of hunt for a bit or does it have multiple? You're probably going to need to visit there four or five times before you find it and there are some that are designed to be that difficult. So when you're looking for your first cache, look at those difficulty and terrain and you're probably going to want to keep it under a 2-2 if you want to have a pleasant experience <laughs> on your first attempt to find a geocache. Did any other caches want to talk about something that was a high level terrain that, yeah? My first one, I did not know, uh, you know what any of these things meant. Right. Uh, so I, I happened to choose a level four terrain and that level three difficulty. <laughs> Ooh, ouch. I was there for three hours. <laughs> 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 I did ma manage to find it. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, I I have not uh, I've not been su super serious about it uh, for the last several years. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, but yeah, you, you it is good to know what all those uh, all those little icons yeah. mean yeah. <laughs> before you try uh, try your first one. Okay. Where was that first one that you found? What uh, city or state? Or it, it was in the pocket wilderness of uh, of, uh, of uh, Dayton, Tennessee. Dayton, Tennessee. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. So history of geocaching. So. The GPS satellites were launched in the 1970s and the 1980s, but they were really there for military use. They weren't there for civilian use. For example, they were used quite a bit during the, during the Gulf War in the early 1990s. And there were civilian receivers along with the military receivers, but the satellites were designed to give accurate uh, location to the military receivers and not too much to the civilian. It was called selective availability. So if you had a civilian one, you could probably take you down the highway, but it might be as much as 300 feet off from where you actually were. So 1996, it was realized that, hey, these satellites might be useful for commercial trucking and boating. So President Clinton signed an executive order saying that selective availability would be disabled. And then it took four years before they finally did it, but May 2nd, 2000, selective availability was disabled. Within 24 hours, a game had begun. So the first cache was uh, placed by this guy, Dave Ulmer in Oregon. Now he was, had been pissed off by the selective availability because he had been out snowmobiling in Oregon and using his GPS and because it was 300 feet off he had gone down the wrong canyon and he went off a cliff and he crashed a snowmobile and he was really annoyed. So when selective availability turned off he stayed up all night watching the signal waiting for it to become more accurate and then he went out the next day and he hid a basically a, a five gallon bucket with some stuff in it, uh, some toys, and he, he then he put out a signal or a, a message on Usenet saying, "Hey, I hid something. See if you can find it. If you get there, you can take something out of the bucket, but leave something of equal or greater value." So then there was a lot of discussion. He, at the time, it was called a GPS stash hunt. And there was a lot, you know, what should we call this new sport? And well, stash is, you know, it's kind of got a drug connotation. We don't, we don't want, don't want to be calling these stashes. Do we call this, this? What about cash? C A C H E. And they like that. And then Dave, who was very into etymology and the idea of how, the idea of ideas, he says, let's not call it the GPS hunt. Let's call it geocaching. It was an active verb. He liked that. So, so that was in May 2000 that the term geocache was coined. Uh, and then a website, you know, as these caches were popping up all over and people were tracking them on a website, and then geocaching.com became a thing in September 2000. That original cache that he placed back in May 2000 is lo no longer there, but there's now a plaque saying original stash. And uh, it, the first geocache placed here, May 3rd, 2000, and this is like, a place of pilgrimage for really serious geocachers. They'll go there to this place in Oregon so they can see where the very first geocache was placed. So we, then a company was formed, Groundspeak, and then they started making different types of caches. Well, there's the traditional cache, there's a multi-cache, you know, letter boxes, and um, it, coming up with more and more different types. And, and so this community was forming around it. And uh, there's a, a language. So I told you about muggles, how that came in. Uh, and then sometimes people will be in a hurry when they post a log, so they'll just say TFTC, thanks for the cash. Now, etiquette is, proper etiquette is, you don't want to put TFTC. Because when someone places a cash, 
or you don't want to put TFTC very often. Because when someone places a cache, that's the CO, the cache owner, they've put some effort into it. They've picked a spot, they've got the container, the logbook, they put some stuff in, they, they register the thing on geocaching.com, and they keep track of it. So if someone says, hey, water got into it, or a squirrel chewed on it, or, or whatever, they go out and they maintain it. So this is all volunteer on their part. So the way you can thank a cache owner is to put something in your log. Oh, hey, I was out here, it was a pretty day, I heard a bird singing. Or I was out here with three of my cousins, they'd never gone caching before. So you're continuing the story and the cache owner kind of gets an idea of who's coming to find their cache. And it, it's a very pleasant thing. Has anyone here hidden a cache? Yeah, w would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, it, it's nice to read the logs and, and it, it's just kind of a, a fun thing that pops up. Um, so if you're in a dreadful hurry and you, you just can do nothing else than TFTC, thanks for the cash. TNLN took nothing, left nothing. Uh, DNF did not find. I told you about lamppost cache. Okay, so if you cannot find a cache, what do you do? Well, first, there's going to be a hint. You can check the hint. Next, if the hint isn't helping you, you can read the other logs of what other people have posted. And often people will post a, a little hint in something. You know, they'll, they'll say something like, you know, searched high and low, and there it was. So you know that the cache might have been lower. Or, um, you know, I banged my head against a rock, and there it was. So, so you'll know that maybe there was a rock. And so reading those logs, sometimes they put hints, sometimes not. Um, if that isn't helping you, you can look at the names of everyone who has found a cache. And you see, do I know any of these people? And then you phone a friend. You call and say, where is it? Or give me a hint. Uh, or, or you can text them. Um, sometimes you can also look at who hid the cache, the CO. And you call the CO and say, OK, Joe, Jane, where is it? I can't find it. If you cannot find the cache, post it. Post a DNF, a did not find. This is not any indicator of your skill. It is just saying you didn't find the cache. And the cache owner generally wants to know that. They want it, maybe it's gone. Maybe it's been muggled. And unless people post DNFs, the cache owner won't know that it's gone. It's also posting a DNF, you're saying, you made your best effort, you didn't find it. And maybe the cache owner is thinking, oh, this is an easy thing to find. And then if they get three DNFs, they'll go, well, maybe it's not as easy as I wanted it to be. So this is, again, your way of communicating to the cache owner. I always post DNFs. Not everyone does, but I recommend posting them. Uh, FTF, first to find. This is a whole nother part of the sport. <laughs> so those who understand, there are people who set up uh, alerts on their phone so that as soon as a new cache is published anywhere within a mile, five miles, ten miles, whatever they want, they get a beep on their phone, new cache, and they will race to see if they can be the first person to find that cache. And by race, I mean they run, they drive over the speed limit, they'll jump over fences, all kinds of crazy stuff. We call them FTF hounds. And I, I've seen people get into, you know, shoving each other because they want to be the first person to sign the log. Anybody else have an FTF story here? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyone else have a story about an FTF they found or a friend of theirs has found? Or uh, speak into the box. Yeah, there was one up in the mountains that had not been found in a long time. Uh -huh. I had actually been there one time before. And then the owner had apparently changed it out to a new location, and then I got an FDF on the yeah. new location. Yeah. So sort of a quasi FDF. Yeah. And it's cool. You get there, and the log is clean. You are right. the first person to sign that log. And there's something special about mm -hmm. that, or going to the cache page and realizing you're the first person to ever have ever logged a cache, either because you got to it first, or it's it's so hard that it's been months and no one else has even given it a try. So it's also good for the cache owner. Uh, when I've posted FTFs, I generally post like three or four or five paragraphs about what it was like and how I was sitting at home and it was dark and it was raining and I saw it, oh man, FTF, you know, I put on my raincoat, <laughs> you know, to rush out there. And so again, it, it's just kind of continuing that story. So then there's another part of the game which is called challenge caches. Uh, this is, say, you might want to find 
um, of these of that one through five grid, you want to find one cache in each box of the grid. So a one, one and a half, uh, one terrain, one and a half difficulty, you know, two and a half terrain, three difficulty. So within that box, there are 81 possible terrain difficulties. And trying to find at least one in all 81 blocks is, it's, a, it's really got a lot of prestige in the community because there's really some effort that goes into f like finding a four and a half, four and a half, and then going after it. It's called the Fizzy Challenge because it's named after a geocacher called Fizzy Magic who uh, early on was one of the first people to be making computer programs to kind of track what, which difficulties and which terrains that people had found. He was called Fizzy Magic because he was a physicist and he was a magician. So that was his cashier name, was Fizzy Magic. So when they came up with this challenge, they called it the Fizzy Challenge or the Well-Rounded Challenge. Uh, there's also the Jasmer Challenge which is also up there very difficult to achieve, which means you have found a cache that was placed in each month since geocaching began. So you found a cache that was placed in May 2000, you found a cache that was placed in June 2000, July 2000, on and on, all the way up to modern day. Modern day, it's, it's fairly easy to find it. Year 2000 caches are tricky to find because they're disappearing. They Caches, no matter how well they cared for, they get carried off, a bulldozer comes through, the cache owner passes away, there, there's all kinds of different things. So for example, yeah, a forest fire, all right. So for example, August 2000, I believe there's only four caches left in the world. And so if you wanna get that, what's called the Jasmer Challenge, you wanna make sure that you have to get to one of those August 2000 caches. Um, Cache Across America is a challenge where you have to find a cache in every state. Not just a cache, but a specific cache. Each state has one specific cache. You have to find that cache in the cache. It's also a three-digit number. Once you've found all 50, you take all those three-digit numbers, you mush them together through a formula, and it gives you what's called the final, the final coordinates, and then you go and you sign the final. So Cache Across America, I think there's only been like 20 people that have actually found all those caches and then gone after the final. Um, uh, Delorme, uh, I'll go on, there's lots of different kinds of challenges. And then there's county challenges. Finding a cache in each county. How many counties can you find a cache in? In the United States, there's over 3,000 counties, but you might wanna try and find like all the counties in a state, or you might want to find what's called contiguous counties, like from uh, Georgia to Colorado and find at least one cache in each county all the way to Colorado or one cache in each county going north to south in the United States or east to west. Just people will, people will play the game in different ways. You need to find which way you find enjoyable and or maybe you don't even want to do a challenge. You just want to go out and find a cache every so often or you take your kids or grandkids or a niece or a nephew. Whatever you find enjoyable, go for it. Of the challenges, yeah, I have a fizzy. I'm going on my double fizzy, um, and uh, Jasmer. I've done the Jasmer as well. I'm working on Cash Across America. I found state. I found uh, the CAA, the Cash Across America caches, in I think 45 states. So I have five more to go. Hawaii and Alaska <laughs> are going to be the tricky ones, but th that's what I enjoy. I enjoy it's called challenge caching. Okay, um, and uh, counties. I've had north to south, I have east to west. I mean, east to west, it's not east to west, it's like east to, to west, you know, but I did, I did get a list of contiguous counties, so that, that's me. Um, so going on with the history, uh, started May 2000, by 2005, there's 180,000 caches around the world. 2013, it's 2.2 million caches. Currently in 2018, there's over 3 million geocaches. So it's a, a sport that's just increasing. Um, some areas, like around here in Atlanta, probably over a thousand new caches per per month, over a thousand per month that are being placed. Uh, there's eight million geocachers out there that love to love to find them and love to hide them. Now, puzzle caches. About 10% of all caches are puzzle caches. What's a puzzle cache? Well, it might be you have to solve coordinates, or it might be there's a thing there 
that you need to figure out. So maybe there's a birdhouse with a trick perch that you have to turn in a certain way to get a false bottom fallout so that you can find the box and sign the log. Um, there's somewhere it says you can find this cache, but make sure you bring AA batteries. So there's some sort of machine there that you have to tug the battery into and then maybe uh, something lowers the cash out of the bottom of a box. Um, air pumps, some, you know, bring your, your tire checker. Um, and musical puzzles. There was a cache I found where there was a little xylophone in the cache and a lock, and the lock had four digits. And it would say, okay, here's a melody you have to play. And each note had a number. So it'd say, play 327, 2211. And then, and then it would say, okay, you know this melody, play the last line. So it might be, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And then you'd have to know the next one and figure out what the numbers were of the, the notes. And then that would be the combination for the lock to open the box to get in and sign the log. And these cash owners will come up with lots of different ways of, of uh, making their logs difficult to access. Uh, a puzzle you might want to solve at home. There might be a Sudoku puzzle. You have to solve it. And then the coordinates would be wherever they'd highlighted in yellow. Uh, codes, lots of codes out there. Uh, some of them are classic ciphers, like this is what's called the pig pen cipher or the Freemason cipher. Um, some of them, a lot of math. This one's not too hard, but they might say, you know, get these five numbers and then solve this formula to get the, co to get the coordinates. Or they might say, hey, here are the coordinates. Mm -hmm. And then you need to figure out how to read a barcode. So you're either going to figure it out on your own or you're going to find a utility somewhere that will you can put this barcode into in order to get the coordinates. Some of them are more techy. I think you'll appreciate this. Uh, you'll have to, you get something and then you have to FTP into a site and it gives you the response string, but hidden in the response string was 641715390. That's a phone number that you would then have to call and enter in that extension and someone had a phone rigged so that if you called that phone and extend, you would say, congratulations, these are the coordinates that you need to go to in order to find the geocache. Uh, other high-tech, uh, they've used uh, near-field communications, beacons, uh, Wi-Fi. So some, it'll say, go to these coordinates and then check your Wi-Fi. You check your Wi-Fi and it gives you all the different SSIDs you can connect to. And one of the SSIDs might be north 38 degrees 41.762. So it's giving you the coordinates that way that you have to check your Wi-Fi. Uh, I've seen a few that also use local radio beacons. So you'll pull up to the coordinates and it'll say, okay, 107.1. So you have to tune your car radio to 107.1, and then you hear a voice saying these are the coordinates you have to go to. This is a, an image manipulation one, so it says the coordinates are here in the image. For this one, what you have to do is figure out that in the crystal ball where it looks white, it's actually two shades of white. One is white white, and one is white in 99% white. And you can't really see it there. But then you get to it, and then the coordinates were there in the crystal ball. Okay. Uh, this was another one where they said the coordinates were in the picture, but they weren't really in the picture. The picture was hosted at a website called showmeit.com. And then if you did a who is on showmeit.com, down there under tech name and tech organization were the coordinates, 15 South going on. And those were actually not straight north-south coordinates either. It was using a different... Uh, yeah, a different system. Uh, this was one that was created uh, for me. They said, okay, Alanka, here's a hard one. And uh, it was a square wave, a ser long, long series of square waves, which you would have to manually transcribe into ones and zeros. And then once you had the ones and zeros, then you could put it into ASCII and then get the coordinates that way. Uh, this was someone who used to be an Air Force navigator. And he used this as a teaching tool for how a sextant would work. So he taught about how sextants work, and then he gave, okay, now let's assume that you're here, and this star is at this azimuth, and this star is here, and what are, what's your location? What are your coordinates? And then that was where the geocache was. Um, this is one of my favorites, a cache is a history lesson. In Washington, D.C., at the World War II Memorial, this was what's called a virtual cache. You didn't have to find a log. You had to find a piece of information. And the information was, go to these coordinates, and no matter where our troops went, he seemed to be there first. It is only right that he is here, too. What is his name? 
And if you went looking around the World War II Memorial, way in the back, there's a little carving. This is a formal carving of Kilroy. And so that was, that was the answer. I thought that was beautiful. And I learned more but that they did this at the World War II Memorial. It was perfect. Uh, now, there's other location-based games out there. <laughs> okay, you're, okay, which game are you excited to see? Ingress. Ingress. Yeah, that's the one with the green green and the blue there. It's uh, basically a big capture the flag game. And right here, there's about 15 of these spots, these portals. And uh, you can get your phone and walk to one of these and say, I claim it for green or I claim it for blue. And there's battles going back and forth. Sorry, sorry, what? Oh, he's wearing green, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is done by a company named Niantic, and Niantic is a split off from Google. And Niantic then went off on to create several other games. For example, Pokemon Go was created by Niantic. Any other games that are in this slide that anybody was excited to see? Yeah. Yeah, Foursquare. It's a location-based game. Yep. Yeah, you're checking in. It's, there's something exciting about that idea of it knowing where you are. You're having to go to a specific physical location and do something. Uh, there's this thing on the left which is called Munzies and then Zombies Run. Anybody play Zombies Run here? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it it's a... You play it, it's a story that you listen to and you are in a futuristic society and you are in a small community that is trying to survive and they need to get supplies outside of the community. So you are a runner, in this case you're runner five and you're going, you have to leave and it's, you, know, you hear the siren, you hear the sound of the gate going up and you're running out there to get supplies to bring back. And so you have this guy who's in your ear say, okay, go, you got another, what, 200 yards to go. Oh no, zombies are coming in from the right. Better speed up. And, and it tracks how fast you're going. Now, I cheat. I play it in my car. So <laughs> I'm always going faster than the zombies. But uh, it's still fun to me to, to listen to the story as I go. Um... Okay, then of course the big one, Pokemon Go, created by Niantic. And then there's other location-based ba location games that are coming up. There's the Walking Dead version, Our World. We've got Jurassic World Alive, Ghostbusters World. Uh, was there a question back there? Uh, which one were you playing? The Walking Dead. Okay, is it good? Okay. And another one that's coming up, Harry Potter Go, Wizards Unite, which should be out, they say, later this year, but I'm guessing it's probably going to be first quarter 2019, but we'll see. We'll see. So let's say, if you want to become a geocacher, join the community, go to geocaching.com. Create an account. It's free. Uh, if you want to become a premium member, it's 30 bucks. Uh, get, get a geocaching app for your phone. The official geocaching app, I think it's it's a pay app. I think it's like $14.99 or I think you can get a free version. Nope. Yeah, you can get a free version. And um, it really doesn't cost much to play, which is one of the things I really like about it. Hmm? Yeah. Now, if you're going to, and this is good, now I'm going to put a caution out there. This is great if you're caching in a city, urban caching. If you're going outside of a city, you want to have some backups. Some, yeah, yeah, you kind of guy that can, no, I don't need a net, I'm out there. <laughs> yeah, but you're, yeah, you're a mutant. <laughs> For most people, I mean, there have been bad stories that have happened. People go into a forest with nothing but their phone, battery runs out, or they drop their phone in a stream, and then they don't know where they are, they have no phone, they have no mechanism, they, they're disoriented. You can get dehydrated. Sometimes we need to send people out to find you. Not him, of course. He never needs help. Talk into the box. In Tennessee, one of the caves I've gone into that had to do a rescue of like seven guys went into a cave with like one flashlight. Hey. And the flashlight went out. 
Right. When I go into a cave, I take seven flashlights. Right, right. You know? Bring a backup. <laughs> Bring a backup. Bring extra batteries. Uh, now, if, if you have a, a battery GPS, no, okay, now here's how to start a fight among geocachers. Get them into a bar and then say, what's the best GPS? Right, and there's gonna be arguments coming up so fast. Oh, you only need your smartphone. Oh, you need the E-Trex. No, the E-Trex sucks. You wanna get a Garmin. Uh, oh, the, the car GPS works just fine. No, car GPS suck. You wanna have a Garmin Oregon. There's many different kinds of GPSs. My recommendation is to have at least one GPS that uses batteries and you're going with extra batteries. That, that's just my recommendation. Not everyone will agree. I used to do that, yeah. but again, I've been using my just the phone the last few years. Right. And uh, if you have the phone, make sure it's charged, have an extra USB battery for your phone. Um, if you're really going out into the boonies, which I've done, I usually go and I not only have a battery-operated GPS, I also have a topographical map, and I have just a plain old compass. If everything else fails, I have a compass. Um, so seriously, have a backup. Uh, yeah, smartphones, you can lose signal. And if you're really going in the boonies, make sure someone knows where you're going so that if you don't show up in a day, they, they know who to call. Yes, the, hand the box to the guy in the green shirt. If you go into the woods, make sure you mark where you parked at. Yeah, yeah. sometimes you kind of forget. <laughs> right, these big parks that have 12 different parking lots, right? And you're tired and you're coming out of the woods and where the F is my car? <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, in the back. Yeah. yeah, 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 losing your car is a pain. Yes, in the back. I would also suggest using the app Telegram for communications with someone that you know that where you're going Yeah. because it's the best program to communicate in very low to zero signal areas so you can know if it was sent oh. or read. Okay. So I use it when I go using, um, when I go to Mexico and there's no data and we're using satellite data, we use Telegram because it's the best way to get a signal. Yeah. So it's the best way to communicate and those kind of things. Yep. Yep. These are all good, good advice. Okay. All right. Um, be prepared. This is if you're going off-road water. You can never have too much water. It, it's heavy, but you can never have too much water. Uh, the usual things about going in the wild, sunscreen, bug repellent, all that. Pencils and pens. And many times I found a cache and, oops, no pen. <laughs> no pen. Yeah, I've gotten a twig, you know, <laughs> and scratch it in there or take a picture of the log. And uh, tweezers are just really good to bring because sometimes you have very, very small logs and you just need a way to, to get, to get the, the log out of there. Um, a little bit about geocaching etiquette. Log your caches when you find it. Log it. Write a couple sentences. If you can't find it, say so. Um, swap evenly. And there's these things called trackables, which might be a, a toy that's in the cache that has a number on it. And you log these uh, and they, uh, their path is tracked on a map. Yes, see, here's a trackable. And is this yours or one that you found recently? Okay. What what's the name of it? Uh, oh, I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> but this is yours personally, so when you meet other cashers, you show it to them, and then they get the number. I have a trackable number on my car, the decal. So someone, if, if they see my car, they'll say, "Oh, saw this car in Ohio at Geo Woodstock." Uh, I saw a hand in the back. Nope, just stretching. Okay. Uh, so if you find a trackable. The general etiquette is keep it moving. Don't don't keep it in your desk. Don't save it for the perfect cache. Just next time you find a cache, drop it in that one. And that way the, the trackable owner will just see that their trackable is going from cache to cache. Some trackables, um, I've seen I've I've seen trackables that they just kind of disappear. It was picked up in one cache and then is gone for six months and maybe it shows up again or maybe it isn't. Yeah. Uh, one thing with trackables is put them in a box you can get into because I was actually going to the place the trackable wanted to go one time and then it was in a box that was locked and you had to go find the key, but there were only two keys to the box and the keys had gone missing. Oh. So the trackable was stuck pretty much forever in the box. Yeah. So, so what did you do with it? I, I just didn't even go try and find it because I didn't yeah. know how to get in the box. Yeah. 
So sometimes the track you can tell the trackable owner or, or whatnot and say, this is never going to happen. Can we repurpose this trackable or repurpose the number? There was a really quick, I found one that it was a Barbie doll that had been dropped. And the goal was that she needed to find her way to Las Vegas. And someone had also dropped a Ken doll that was all supposed to find his way to Las Vegas. And they were going to meet at one of those drive through uh, wedding places, which is also, you, when you drive up, they hand you the box and it's an ammo can painted white with lace around it. Uh, it it's called a special memory. And it would have been cool to have Ken and Barbie meeting at this wedding chapel, but Ken went missing. And so then what do you do with Barbie? She just keeps traveling forever looking for Ken. Yeah. So uh, I've actually had uh, a uh, trackable sent to me uh, across the country uh, by a, uh, a family member. Uh, it did detour off into Hawaii, but it eventually <laughs> uh, arrived within a mile of my home. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's good, because uh, about, I would say about a third of the time, they just disappear. Yeah. Yes. I actually discovered geocaching uh, by trackables. Uh, I huh. was part, part of the Where's George community, uh, which is tracking money you know, uh, across the country. And uh, there are some Where's George people that are actually annoyed when one of their bills, uh, which has a stamp on it, uh, go, goes into a geocache. And some love it. There's a lot of crossover, but... Uh, but, but it, Th this is whereesgeorge.com? Yeah, yeah, whereesgeorge.com. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I actually said, huh, that sounds interesting. I think, that, I think I'll look into it. <laughs> that, that's, how, that's why I'm here, yeah. ultimately. Yeah, I used to play whereesgeorge.com. Every dollar bill, you'd like stamp it. And then the, you'd enter the serial number into where'sgeorge.com, and you could see where your dollar bill was was you know traveling. But the banks hated it, and when they'd see a bill that had been defaced, you know they'd take it out of circulation. And but uh, yeah, it was a fun game for a while. Not defacement. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, he, uh, defacement has a very specific uh, legal uh, uh, legal meaning. Uh, let, let him keep talking into the box. Yeah. Uh, yeah, where's George is not defacement. Pretty much as, as long as you are not. Uh, Stamping in specific places, like on the like on the actual face or on the uh, the number, or uh, or the the more uh, more modern ones like that, the security strips. It's not the face. Huh? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So all all the bills that I stamped just disappeared on their own. Yeah, well, yeah well, <laughs> I've I've had the sleepers that like uh, like eight or nine years later yeah. they popped up again. So yeah, so, I mean, not everyone uh, takes a look at a dollar bill and says, "Huh, I wonder what that's about." Oh. Hey, cool. Thank you. Okay. What? Oh, I thought you were going to ask a question. No. Okay. All right. So, um, a little bit more about etiquette. It's it's nice, not required, but it's nice if you carry some replacement items with you. Let's may, say maybe a log is full and you're going to put in some new paper. Uh, maybe you have some extra pencils like those little golf pencils and you can drop those into a cache. Uh, or swag, that you can go to a dollar store and get a bunch of little plastic items and then toss them into geocaches. It's a nice thing to do. Um, before hiding a cache, it's generally good practice to spend some time finding them first. The recommendation, not required, just recommendation, is that you find at least 100 caches before attempting to hide one. This is just to avoid a lot of the common mistakes that come when, when hiding a cache. People will not know that they need to do certain things when they hide a cache. There's maintenance that is required. Um, but, but if you want to hide one right away, there's nothing stopping you. Again, you're kind of welcome to do whatever you want, play the game the way you want. There are what's called reviewers. So when you hide a cache, it does have to go through a review before it can be published. The reviewers are going to check for certain basic things. One is that you're not placing it somewhere really stupid. You're not placing it in the middle of an interstate. You're not placing it in a kid's playground, so all of a sudden adults are coming in and looking around in a kid's playground. Um, you're not placing it for commercial purposes, like you can't place a cache. Oh yeah, here's a geocache in Joe's used car parking lot or something. Uh, that, that the cache is being placed for good faith reasons. Also, caches cannot be too close together. Caches need to be at least a tenth of a mile apart, 528 feet. So that's something else that a reviewer will be checking. Um, okay, so if you want to find out more, 
uh, geocaching.com. Also, there's some wonderful podcasts for the geocaching community. One of them is Podcasher out of San Diego. It's by a, a married couple, Sonny and Sandy. So Sonny and Sandy and Sandy San Diego. Uh, they have a son named Sean. So now it's S, S, and S. And then they, they just got a dog. And I think they named the dog with an S name as well. I don't know if anyone li listens to the cast. But it's, it's a one, they do it every week. And they talk about stories. People write to them, tell them things about what's going on in the community. If there's news going on, like uh, a cache was found somewhere and it caused a bomb threat because you know people thought that it was not nice to be. This is another reason that reviewers will check to make sure that the cache is probably not going to be somewhere where it's going to be seen as a threat. Uh, there's also a great podcast called Inside HQ, which is from from geocaching headquarters and geo gearheads, and they love talking about the technical aspect of geocaching. If you want a book. Um, there aren't many, but Complete Idiot's Guide to Geocaching is good. So summary, uh, started in May 2000. It's a crowdsourced activity. 10% of the caches are puzzle caches, and it's a great teaching tool. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can contact me, um, elonka at gmail.com. My geocacher name is Elonka. And thank you very much. Have fun.